Hi, everybody. Um, here's, um, gosh, again, I started off uh, today's conversation by saying that I'm humbled to be in the room with these men. Um, next to me is Robert Eager. 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 I knew I was going to mess that okay. up. And um, he started DC Central Kitchen. And we have James Withers. Jim. Jim who's a doctor going out on the streets doing street medicine at street level to homeless people. I mean, come on, gosh, it doesn't get any cooler than that. So, Robert, tell me about D.C. Central Kitchen. Well, we're in the basement of what was, and probably still remains, the biggest shelter in America. Why we kind of, in Washington, D.C., kind of went down that road is, is still an interesting mystery, but the idea is this shelter was built for 1,400 people. So anyway, we're in the basement, and it's right around the corner from the capital of the United States, which gives us a, an amazing um, platform to really talk about, at times, incendiary ideas. Like, you know, for example, we do um, food recycling. So restaurants, hotels, hospitals, the capital. At the end of the night, there's food left over. We collect it, bring it back here. Job training program, 12 weeks long for a year. That trains men and women out of prison, out of treatment programs, off the streets. Um, the food gets very deliberately targeted out to agencies that we feel share our sense of we got to liberate people versus keep them in this machine. Um, we do outreach programs. We have businesses. So we've tried to really uh, launch a bunch of interesting ideas here. And, and our most recent interesting, um, it's probably, I think, one of the more interesting experiments in America is just last week we started a contract with the city to do locally sourced, cook from scratch meals for seven DC public schools. So the idea is again, it's a combination of we're buying local, we're cooking from scratch, but the people who are cooking are people who are homeless. Um, yeah, you talk about, and it's funny because they love the first two parts, but the, the say what moment came when the idea was, because they're like, man, we can't. Say what moment? Well, I mean, seriously, because you know, we push that envelope hard. It's like, look, as we said earlier, you know, all our businesses, we pay everybody 13 an hour with benefits. Trying to say, in effect, look, if we can hire a person out of prison, and we can buy local, and we can um, hire a, a, you know, pay a good wage, and we can make a profit, you know, we've proven a theory, and that's kind of what I'm interested in. Now, so is this a for-profit, or are you a non-profit? Well, we're a, a non-profit, although I, I really chafe at that limitations of .com, .org. I think right. it's a foolish divide. Right. So we're, you know, we're a little bit of each and not enough in either, as Archie Bunker used to say. Now, how did you start? Um, I was a nightclub person um, who knew enough about food service to envision a way in which you could feed more people better food for less money, but also shorten the line through job training. And I was also probably like we all have in common, stubborn enough to what I was told it wouldn't work <laughs> to say, in effect, you, you know, where's it? You know, no one's ever tried it. Doesn't mean just because no one's done it doesn't mean it can't work. Right. So I think probably like all of us, we harbored that notion of somehow getting an idea, starting, and then going back to what your original calling was, right. which for me was, um, again, I, I just always believe in the power of music, you know, to change the world. So I'm just now using the power of food to change the world. Wow. Jim, going under bridges, helping people. That just, you didn't just start doing that. How did that evolve? Well, I, you know, I come from a background where um, in my family, um, I made house calls with my dad and, you know, getting getting into the lives of people just seems so organically connected with being a doctor, being a healer. Um, and yet, as you, as you go through the medical school and everything like that, and I became a teacher, you realize that your hands are tied with so many kinds of people because um, you can, you can slap your solutions on them, but you're really not getting to the root of who they are, what they're going through. And as a teacher, I just needed a new classroom, one where uh, we could get out of the white lab coat for a while and just see what the world looks like from the outside. So I started going under bridges in uh, the early 90s, 91, 92, um, making house calls with a backpack and uh, meeting interesting people uh, and then having to come to some kind of a a real human connection and, and um, coming to grips with what I was seeing. And um, there's a huge underbelly in the society that we, we kind of know is there, but uh, until you walk, you know, into those camps and spend time in those abandoned buildings, you just don't see it um, from that.
perspective. It's evolved to where we have a, a program that has medical students and nursing students. We have it's operation safety net in Pittsburgh, um, where we have case management. Uh, we, we help people navigate the health system, uh, getting into primary care, uh, decreasing their use of emergency rooms and the hospitals, um, and getting them into housing and other, other kinds of things. In uh, 2005, we were able to have our first international street medicine, we're calling this field now street medicine, uh, gathering in Pittsburgh. We're having our sixth international meeting in Los Angeles um, this October. And we when have in the, October? Uh, October 20th to 23rd. I might be around. And the, the website is streetmedicine.org. Gotcha. And uh, so we have participants from, um, hopefully we'll have some from Africa, but we have uh, Asia, Europe, uh, South, Central America, wow. North America, Alaska, and Hawaii. Uh, we were just talking about food. You know, food is medicine, man. Well, that's true. That is true. And, and food is community. Right. And ultimately, I think we've discovered that uh, unless you're able to uh, put yourself out there and become part of the community, you don't you, you don't connect. And that's what this is all about. Now, why do you, now I know this, but people might be asking why the importance of street medicine? Why don't they, you know, just go to the emergency rooms or, or different things? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons, and you can the beauty of this is you you can argue it from any angle, and it makes sense. You can argue it from an economic sense. Um, people just get sicker and sicker, and they cost a lot more money, or they die, um, and uh, that's that's just a tragedy, um, and it's it's a it's a it's a measure of the degree to which we're civilized. I think um, what level of suffering we allow amongst our our brothers and sisters. Um, it's it's really good in terms of having different elements of, of the community that were distrustful and and um, alienated from each other to be able to mix in a human way and and do something together. Our, all, every team has a formerly homeless person on it, um, and we wow. you know we engage the strengths of the of the street community um, in in the healing process as well. Uh, it's a great classroom. We have students who come from all over the country that want to to, to a month or, or more uh, just putting that backpack on and, and listening, sitting by the riverbanks and and, and uh, getting to know people. And then also seeing how it is to walk with them into the things that they need. When you share that experience, uh, it humanizes it. It's not always pretty, but I think just that sense that it's real is something that students uh, Really appreciate in their, in their life, um, so I think it's a it's a it's an all, it's a win 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 situation. Um, the three of us just met today. Um, it was orchestrated by the Because Foundation, and we've been sitting here just jaw jacking and talking uh, for a while, and uh, kind of like a homeless think tank, if you will. And I have to apologize because I should have recorded this and live fed it. Uh, about halfway into it, I was going, gosh, this is great stuff. And Robert has an incentive program. Do you want to talk about that? Because I thought that the one where you were talking about incentives for nonprofits, where you're talking oh, about the. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, right now, nonprofits, we, we're supposed to fix everything with grants, checks in the mail, you know. And, um, you know, if you think about it right now, you have this, this artificial divide that says dot com drives the economy, makes money, well, .org does good deeds, you know. So I, I've been intrigued because if you, you know, middle of the town, we, not probably we don't have any access to capital. And that really keeps us in this threadbare mode where we have to fight each other for scraps, you know, versus really think collectively and move forward. So I became really intrigued because, um, you know, recently I was reading about how Microsoft was having an anniversary. And I just wondered what would it have been like if you invested a thousand bucks in 1986 from the public and come to find out you would have earned a half a million dollars. But coincidentally, I also just met, um, and similar to our conversation, there was a conversation here with Muhammad Yunus once about microcredit and, and its need in the U.S. Um, and he had, in 1983, gone public with his nonprofit. But if you had invested a thousand bucks in the Grameen Bank when it opened, which has since elevated almost 100 million people out of poverty with small loans who are only eligible for a one-time tax deduction because you gave to a charity. So it's like, let me see, a thousand bucks to Microsoft, you got a half a million, a thousand bucks to Microsoft, you get 1,000. Why not an annual tax deduction with increasing value based on the same rate of return principle as a dividend if an organization can show how many men and women 
didn't go to the emergency room and how much money that saved the collective us. How many people graduate from a program and for example our graduates will have four classes, 80 people graduate. On average the men and women who go through the program and stick with the job will earn two million dollars in salaries which of course is rent, food, gas, but they'll also pay 200 grand in payroll taxes into the city treasury. So why an investment in the kitchen can't be rewarded differently? But you open that doorway it's just, it is just a policy. It's just electing people who have a bolder, broader vision of how the economy can work for us versus against us. That's just a sample of what we were talking about. And another big conversation, and I'll uh, throw this at Jim, was community. Yeah. The importance of community for healing this social crisis. I think we have to look at uh, community in uh, radically different ways because, you know, the, the, po the policies and the, and the instincts that we're following right now are that uh, we, we divide more and more and more. Uh, we uh, put barriers up in silos. Um, so street medicine is just one example of a way that, you know, you, you turn this upside down and you, you actually have to listen. Street people are wonderful that way. You have to listen to them uh, if you're going to get anywhere. Uh, you have to work on, on their terms. And everyone's an individual. Uh, every customer, if you will, is absolutely uh, uh, a priceless uh, resource that you have to listen to to be able to solve the problem. So I think it, you learn a great deal um, by honoring uh, and respecting each individual that way. Um, and in, in a sense, that liberates us from, you know, having to wear the white lab coat all the time, having to deal with things, you know, from my paradigm as opposed to maybe rethinking them from, from your your perspective. Great. I really try to keep these short and you know I could sit here for another six hours talking you know but you guys would by now uh, have to run and go shave or do something so um, any last words anything that you'd like to say about your organization or nonprofits? Or? Well I mean again the, the future isn't for-profit nonprofit it's just community. You know, and there's this huge moment, man. We got a younger generation coming up, breathe, just living and breathing service and new media, and an older generation looking for almost redemption in a way. And that is a, that is an amazing power that if we tap into and aren't limited by the idea of us and them, man, there's no stopping us. Jim, well, our new organization is the Street Medicine Institute, and we are looking for partnerships in uh, any community where they have street people. And we will help set up programs with them, um, hopefully linking this to their, the, the learning opportunities and the empowerment of the people that are there. So I'm just really happy to be part of the social networking that you're doing. And you're streetmedicine.org? N.com. N.com <laughs> and dccentralkitchen.org. Right. So anyways, thank you all for joining us. And uh, please... Uh, go to their website, you'll find out more and support these great men doing a great work. Nice work with you, man. Thank you. <laughs>